Hi and welcome to this context lesson on Checking Out Me History by John Agard. This is a really, really interesting poem. Um, when I read it the first time, I was just like, what, <laughs> what is he on about? Because he has all these references to different figures in history and there's a kind of mixture of the ones that you know really well or that we're taught in schools quite often and then ones that we're just never really taught about but they're also really prominent figures. So he's kind of contrasting his personal history and his heritage with um, the more kind of standard history that we're presented with in schools. And I found myself getting really interested in all these figures that he talks about, but also the more that I learned about them, the more the whole poem makes sense. Because I think the point of this poem is that it's a starting place for history and you're encouraged to go and find out your own history as well, but also find a bit more out about Agard and who he is and where he comes from. So this is just kind of like a mini revision session on the important historical points of um, checking out me history. So firstly, he's an Afro-Guyanese poet. So he's from uh, Guyana, which is in the West Indies or the Caribbean, which um, some of you may be familiar with and some of you may really not know very much about. So I'm gonna kind of brush over the basics of it really and see kind of like you know take it as if you don't know anything about that part of the world or the um, the cultural heritage of Agard. So basically he moved to England when he was 28 years old from the West Indies uh, so he's got this kind of double background going on between um, feeling like he's part of the UK and he's British and also feeling like he's got this Gu Guyanese heritage, uh, West Indian, Caribbean kind of heritage. His mother also is Portuguese so he's got this kind of part European, part otherness going on, which is really interesting as well. Personally, I'm mixed race too, and my cultural heritage is half English, half Pakistani. So I find it quite interesting exploring those tensions in your history and, and culture. So whether you're mixed race or whether you're kind of from a single place, whether you've ever moved around in your history or whether you're kind of your family's always from that same part where you are now, it's interesting to think about what is your history, what makes you as a person. And I think that this is the main tension and the main kind of conflict um, at the centre of his poetry. So yeah, uh, Guyana used to be called British Guyana. So basically it's a, um, it used to be a colony of Britain. So it was kind of owned by Britain at one point um, when we had an empire. And as the empire collapsed, it kind of took back a lot of its heritage and its kind of roots, but also there's a lot of transportation going on there. So people move um, through the colonies and they kind of migrate their culture when they move with them. So if they come from Africa and they end up in the Caribbean, they bring that African cultural heritage, which personally, although a lot of people criticize imperialism and colonialism, and there's a lot of negativity that is clearly terrible that comes out of it, slavery being a really obvious one. Um, there is also this kind of rich fusion and intermingling of cultures, which I think is a more kind of positive outcome of that type of thing as well. So people in the Caribbean quite often feel culturally close to British history, but also kind of conflicted with that because um, a lot of their own personal heritage comes from being colonized by the British. So there's this kind of tension between the British being oppressive and controlling or the British being kind of part of their culture and the way that they're taught and um, the way that their kind of education system works. They are kind of taught a lot of um, British Kind of history as we'll see. So a few of these uh, references then that we have, I'm going to start with some kind of references that you might know already. He talks about 1066 and the, the Battle of Hastings. So 1066 is a, a date that I got drummed into my head when I was a kid and probably a lot of you did as well and it's um, what we call the Battle of Hastings. So it's this time when it's kind of a, a pivotal moment in British history where you have William, the Duke of Normandy, so he's a French guy. <laughs> he comes over to England and he's sort of taking over um, the Anglo-Saxons that already reside there. So you've got this fight between King Harold Godwinson, who's already um, the king in power, and William, Duke of Normandy. And this is kind of giant battle, which culminates in Harold's death 
and William takes over. And from our point in history at 1066, we suddenly, in the UK, we end up with all this French kind of infusion into our culture for hundreds of years after it actually becomes kind of popular to speak French if you're very posh and only the lower classes um, are taught English, but the upper classes are taught French, Latin and um, English as well, obviously. So French seems to be kind of like an infusion into our culture at that point, and it's a point of sophistication. And if you're in a UK school, um, or you're in even a colonised, an ex-colony of the UK, uh, quite often you'll learn about this important moment in history, this battle. There's another very typical English reference about Dick Whittington and he cat, or his cat. Um, so Dick Whittington is this kind of folk story, a little bit like a lullaby or a nursery tale, that type of thing that we're told. And it's this quite interesting story about this guy who's born very poor and he kind of builds himself up out of nothing. So he comes from the countryside, he moves to London, he somehow acquires this cat. <laughs> and the cat is um, very, very good at mousing. So basically he ends up making a fortune by selling his cat um, to be a mouser on ships. And it's a kind of rags to riches story where Dick Whittington starts from nothing and he ends up the Lord Mayor of London. And it's through his resourcefulness and his kind of, um, his own kind of knowledge and intelligence that he's able to improve himself. So we call it a rags to riches story. And it's a story about um, a boy who's born with nothing and ends up with everything. And he ends up in a position of political power and prominence. So the story itself is very positive, but Agard's criticism of it is that, again, it's just Western, it's very English. It's something that we're taught about that forms part of our culture, but we're not taught about similar stories of people in other places like the West Indies that have um, equally those kinds of backgrounds. If you look into Dick Whittington, the historical figure that it's based on is actually not um, he's not like a rags to riches kind of guy. He's, he's born reasonably wealthy and he does end up Lord Mayor. So the, the kind of history has been fictionalized and exaggerated to sort of emphasize how great it is. But actually the reality of that story is not so great as you'd hope, if that makes sense. Um, and then there are these figures in Agard's own culture that are genuinely impressive. You know, they come from nothing and they end up with everything and they end up in these positions of power so he's paralleling dick whittington and maybe the fictionalization fictionalization <laughs> or over exaggeration of um that story with the fact that we're not even taught about these amazing figures that do this whole rags to riches thing where they go from nothing to everything um, and they genuinely do make that transition across their lifetime so one of those guys that um, Dick Whittington gets contrasted with in the poem is Toussaint L'Ouverture and um, he's just an amazing guy. I'd not actually heard of him before this uh, poem but I got really excited about him and really interested in his history because he's, he's sort of this guy who his father is born a free man in Africa and then he gets enslaved and he gets taken to um, San Domingue which is now called Haishi, the Haishi, Haiti. I'm really bad with my pronunciation today, I don't know why. Haiti, so he's he's Haitian, we say. Um, but San, San Domingan, I think you would say, at this time, because it's, it's changed its name. So, yeah, so his father's African and he's born free, but then he's um, taken into slavery and kind of shipped across the world to a totally new place. And kind of um, Toussaint himself is born in captivity and slavery. And there's a lot of debate and kind of theories about how he managed to do this, but he had educated himself while he was on a plantation. So he's born um, on a plantation, which is basically like a giant farm where slaves are meant to pick the, uh, the produce of the farm, usually cotton or something like that. And um, yeah, he's born into this position where his whole life is supposed to be growing up on this farm picking um, whatever the resources of the farm is, never making any money, never having any way to overcome his situation. So he's about as trapped and as kind of poor and down and out as he possibly can be at the start of his life. And he finds a kind of 
way to educate himself, arguably uh, through his grand his godfather, Pierre Baptiste. Um, there are examples of more kind slave owners that en enabled their slaves to educate themselves or to kind of better themselves. So even though slavery itself obviously is a horrific thing, not all slave owners are equally bad. Some of them are terrible. Um, some of them kind of take pity on the slaves or they emph empathize with them. Um, or they kind of, you know, uh, have this more kind of personal relationship with them. And it's likely that Toussaint had that kind of relationship with his owner. Um, he said, which I really like as a quote, I was born a slave, but nature gave me the soul of a free man. So throughout his life, he's got this drive where he's like, I'm going to be free. And I'm not just going to be free. I'm going to be, you know, better <laughs> than pretty much anyone. And um, yeah, and he becomes this huge hero and he leads um, a slave rebellion in 1791 against the French who have kind of oppressed, oppressed him and sort of taken over uh, San Domingue. So he is called the first black Republican in Agard's story and that means that he's kind of, um, he's able to kind of circumnavigate the French political system, oppose the French and then get instated in a position of political power. So he not only fights the French and sort of succeeds, but then he ends up instated in a position of power in the country uh, which he was born and in, in which he was originally enslaved. So he goes from um, someone who's completely oppressed by the culture and the society of the place that he lives in to someone who is a creator of the culture and the society and he gets to um, you know, be involved in policies of the government and the country there. He then calls himself governor general, which is kind of like saying he's president for life. So he, he gets so far up this political system that he's like not only Lord Mayor, like Dick Whittington, but he's governor general and he's in a position of um, perpetual power. So the whole time he's alive, he's in charge of that country in terms of its government. So he has a bit of a sad ending to his life and it's really, really sad, but it is also quite inspirational. So basically he gets tricked by this sneaky French guy <laughs> um, called Jean-Baptiste Brunet. And uh, in 1802, they invite him to a parlay, which is like, if you've ever seen Pirates of the Caribbean, you might know what that is, but there's meant to be this honor code where if you invite someone to a parlay, it means that there's nothing can happen to you. Um, you, it's like a meeting where both parties are not, they agree not to fight each other while the meeting is going on. But they uh, tricked him, they invited him to a parley, they captured him, they took him back to France, and then they imprisoned him and starved him until he died. So in 19, uh, sorry, in 1804, um, he ends up uh, dying in a, in a French prison, which is really sad. Um, but Haiti, or San Domingue as it's called at the time, becomes independent and it names Toussaint the father of Haiti. So he's this huge figure. If you've ever been to Haiti or you know anything about Haitian culture, he's a huge revered figure over there in their history. And he's just inspirational. He goes from nothing to everything. He doesn't just save himself. He has an entire rebellion of people that he um, guides into, you know, fighting for freedom and fighting for a better future. And even though his personal life ends tragically, um, he's called L'Overture because an overture in music is like the opening to something greater. Um, and that's sort of how he's thought of as a figure in history. People think he's the, the guy that started this huge rebellion and this kind of fight against slavery. And about maybe kind of 80 years after this, slavery gets abolished finally in um, America. And there's this huge debate about the ethics of slavery. So he starts in the late 1700s and by the late 1800s, slavery is abolished. And obviously there's still a lot of um, fighting going on in terms of equal rights for uh, previous kind of slave cultures. But at the same time, um, it's, it's a stepping stone in history and it kind of starts with people like this guy, like Toussaint. So Agard really wants us to know about this guy because obviously he's amazing and he's really, really powerful and really cool. And it's quite remarkable how he comes from nothing and how much he's able to do with how little he's given in life. 
Um, and he's an inspirational figure. And I, I would definitely agree that he's far more inspirational than Dick Whittington that we get taught about in schools. So it's not that Dick Whittington's bad, but it's that there's even better examples that are real historical examples that are overlooked by our curriculum and our syllabus, maybe just because it's not, um, you know, British or it's not tied to Western culture. It's uh, seen as an alternative history or kind of, you know, um, irrelevant. So the point is that we should open this debate about history and we should start to learn all these figures. And it shouldn't really matter if they're from the same country as us. We should be inspired by people who start Haitian revolutions, even if we personally have never been to Haiti because this guy, you know, he's incredible and he should be remembered. So yeah, I kind of went on a ramble there, but hopefully you can <laughs> see how much I like this guy. So another guy um, that we're taught a lot about is uh, Lord Nelson, Horatio Nelson and the Battle of Waterloo. And um, he's actually, you know, I think a really uh, interesting and quite strong figure in history. Um, the Waterloo itself is a, is a huge battle, which they think in the Napoleonic Wars, it kind of was the end of the Napoleonic Wars. And it was a, a sort of um, Napoleon, who's this mad French French guy. He's really interesting. He's actually Italian originally, but he kind of considers himself part of um, French culture. And he thinks he's kind of like a demigod or a leader. He's a bit of a megalomaniac. It's, it's worth reading about him. He's fascinating. I read like pages and pages about Napoleon when I was researching this story because he's a lunatic. Um, but yeah, Napoleon, he's sort of taking over. He's also involved in Toussaint and Haiti. Haiti. I can never say that one. Haiti because, um, yeah, they, they sort of expand and they have the empire. And obviously if the, Fr if the French have taken over San Domingue, then it's under French rule. And, and at the same time, Napoleon's involved in that. So he's this guy and he's a bit of a kind of crazy figure in history. Um, and he's, he just tries to take over everything. So he's kind of in the late 1700s, early 1800s, kind of rampaging through Europe and the wider world, um, trying to take over. And he gets loads of people invested in his cause because he's a really charismatic kind of guy. And Nelson, um, who's a, a British figure, opposes him and he has a reputation for being bold and brave so he's at one point he loses an eye in battle and that's a kind of symbol of his bravery um yeah and it, it's thought that his efforts and the way that he fought and how uh even if it seemed like you know he wasn't going to win he would still fight and he would lead his troops and he would be at the forefront of the battle and he would try you know the best that he could to protect Britain from being invaded by France. Um, and it's thought that he's kind of, you know, had a huge impact on on um, the politics of Europe, really, at that time, which still affects us today. So we learn a reasonable amount about Nelson and Waterloo. I didn't personally actually learn about him in school, but I have read about him quite a lot. And he is a figure that I've heard of a lot of. And we don't hear about Shaka, the great Zulu, who's a comparable figure. Obviously, the, there's a rhyme there with Waterloo, Zulu. Um, but he's, a, he's an African king and he was involved in um, kind of Zulu expansion through different tribes in Africa. And he developed all these kind of crazy military tactics and he was extremely brave and he's very great politically. He's a really fascinating figure, but because he's African, because he's tied to Zulu culture, we don't um, learn about him the same way we might learn about Nelson. So again, we've got this parallel of this guy we learn about, this guy we don't because of their culture or their background. So Agard's trying to redress that difficulty or that kind of um, discrepancy between who do we deserve to learn about and who do we not. So one of my absolute favorite figures um, or really interesting kind of balance here is uh, Florence Nightingale versus Mary Seacole. Um, and there's loads of debate about this still. Some people really like Nightingale, some people really like Seacole. Usually people don't like both, so you can kind of decide 
who do you prefer? But in English schools, usually we learn about Florence Nightingale. I remember doing loads about her myself. So she's this figure called the, you know, the Lady of the Lamp, and she was this kind of very famous Victorian figure who, um, during the Crimean War, she was really involved in training a lot of nurses um, to properly treat and heal the sick or wounded soldiers. And she had a huge impact, uh, not just physically on, you know, healing a lot of people and saving lives, but also psychologically, people were really inspired by her story because she's this woman and she kind of rises up the ranks of the medical world and she becomes um, quite prominent. Queen Victoria herself kind of meets her and uh, tells the British public about how amazing she is. And so she she's a very, very popular figure in Victorian society and it's quite progressive how she is, to be honest, because, you know, she's this powerful woman that's um, really revered and seen as a hero. And it's quite difficult as a woman in those times to be, uh, you know, on that trajectory and become that famous and become that powerful. Uh, they set up hospitals and training academies in her honour. So she had a huge impact even into the present day on, on medical care. But Agard's problem with her is she's um, in a Western context. So she learns Western medicine. She learns, uh, you know, the same way if you were training to be a doctor or a nurse now, she learns that whole system that we have in place that's a very uh, westernized system of medicine. And Mary Seacole, who I love, <laughs> I think she's amazing. She's this um, British Jamaican woman. So she had part Scottish, part uh, African heritage. So she's a mixed race lady and she, um, she just, I can't even start with her story. It's just like amazing. <laughs> so she, she comes from a long line of doctoresses. So the women in her family are sort of healers and medicine women. They use traditional medicine um, to heal people. And they have this tradition that they pass down and this way that they educate the next generation in their family to become a healer and to use uh, herbal medicines and that kind of thing to treat all kinds of sicknesses and illnesses. So Mary Seacole is a doctor or a nurse and she's not educated, you know, she doesn't have a doctor degree. She's not qualified within the English way of, or the British way of looking at medical things. But at the same time, she's really an amazing um, healer and she's a, a very prominent figure in Jamaica. And she hears about the Crimean War, same as Florence Nightingale, and she's like, I need to go and I need to help people. I need to go and heal people and I have to be there. So she applies to the same place that, you know, Florence Nightingale applies to for funding and for money to kind of support going to the Crimean War because it's a, it's a massive mission to get out there in those times because it's uh, kind of like on the edge of Europe, Russia. Um, and these guys are trying to come from like Jamaica. So you can imagine that's a mission in the Victorian times. So she gets denied all her applications and people don't trust her because she's mixed race, because she's not from Britain and because she's not medically trained how we think you should be. Uh, so all of her expertise and all of her knowledge um, is just discounted and counted as no longer valid because she's not from a Western context. And she doesn't care, so she just finds a way to go anyway. So she still, um, she funds herself in the end through investments and that kind of thing. And she gets to the Crimea and she sets up this thing called the British Hotel. And it's like on the edge of where the war is happening. And um, yeah, she heals people and she lets them come and kind of hang out at a hotel and convalesce. So they, they go there for a place of like recovery and it's a mixture of physical and psychological recovery. Um, and yeah, and she's kind of raising her own funds. She's doing it all off her own back. This is in the 1800s. And um, she's just got such strong willpower and determination that nothing really phases her and she does it anyway. So we have these ideas that, you know, um, why is Florence Nightingale a hero and why is Mary Seacole ignored? Um, and nowadays she's actually getting more prominent. People are starting to remember her story. She has some really amazing diaries that I really recommend reading if you're interested in her as a figure, because fascinating. 
So there's a debate going on. Is Florence Nightingale worse than Mary Seacole? Is she better than Mary Seacole? Are they both really good? Agard doesn't give us an answer to this, but he makes us engage with that debate and that's kind of what's important there. So a couple of <laughs> a couple of final really small ones just to look at, like last little figures in this poem. Robin Hood, which you hopefully have heard of, uh, he robs from the rich and gives to the poor. He's a kind of like Northern slash Midlands British figure. He maybe was real, he maybe was mytho mythologized um, or fictional, but the idea was that he was a, a kind criminal. <laughs> so he's a ruffian um, and he does dodgy things like stealing money, but he always gives it away. So it's not selfish reasons, it's kind of um, trying to redress the wealth balance and that kind of thing. So he's from the 1200s, from the 13th century. And he has a group of merry men. He marries Maid Marian. Really interesting story. I recommend going more into Robin Hood if you've not heard of him before. Um, yeah, and old King Cole, he's a merry old soul because there's this kind of nursery rhyme about him. No one really knows who King Cole is, if he's real or fictional. But again, it's a thing... Um, that we're taught about this kind of happy old king who, um, you know, likes music and he's just, he's just kind of like a happy little nursery rhyme figure. So those are two Western or kind of British figures in history or kind of myth that we're presented with. And the final one that I really love is Nanny de Maroon. Um, and she's a real life figure again. So she's not fairy tale or folklore. She's, uh, a genuine woman figure and she was born in the 1600s in Africa in Ghana and um, somehow she got to Jamaica they don't know if it was uh, brought as a slave or if it's some other kind of way that she got there there's not that much kind of clear records of her but yeah she led a group of ex-slaves so formerly enslaved people called the Windward Maroons and they rose up against the British and they fought them so she kind of emancipated she freed slaves and she kind of took them back to their African roots and their origins their way of living so um in Jamaica she set up these kind of tribal uh colonies or kind of tribal places where they live in these communities that copy their African heritage. So it's like they still live in Africa, but now they're in Jamaica, but they're kind of preserving their traditions and their culture there. Um, she's credited with freeing over a thousand slaves. And um, she kind of was fighting the British for a 30 year period and she's just kind of fierce. <laughs> so she's really cool. Um, and I recommend reading about her too. So just as a tiny recap, just to finish, I'm gonna go through those figures again, just so that you kind of got them in your head. So we have the Battle of Hastings, and then we have Dick Whittington, and Dick Whittington is contrasted with Toussaint Louverture. Then we have um, Nanny de Maroon is kind of off on a limb by herself. <laughs> we have Lord Nelson and Waterloo, who's contrasted with Shaka, the great Zulu. And then we have, um, there's a small mention of Columbus. He's an explorer who's credited with discovering America, even though he didn't actually, um, I didn't mention him, but he, he, most people know who Columbus is. There's the Crimean War, which is 1853 to 56. And we have two really prominent female figures, Florence Nightingale, who's um, revered as a hero, even in the modern world, and Mary Seacole, who is arguably just as powerful and just as important, but completely ignored or not really taught in schools. And then finally, we have a couple of kind of cute little fictional figures, Robin Hood, Old King Cole. So it's about paralleling your personal history and your heritage with the history that you're taught in this formal official setting in schools. And it's about going on a journey to find who you are and what is your roots and your heritage, as well as just thinking of history as just a random subject that we have to learn and memorize. So the point is that history should really connect to us and our identity and our who we are as people and how our world is structured. And Agard is trying to encourage us to do that, as well as giving us a flavor about his own heritage and these people that he really respects and kind of admires from his own history. 
Um, so yeah, hopefully that was really helpful for you. I've kind of whizzed through it because I'm aware that it's quite a long lesson and it's only on a small section of the poem, but I feel like once you understand this bit, the rest of the poem is very easy. If you don't quite get this bit, then everything's kind of difficult and you won't know what to say on it. So yeah, hopefully you've got a lot of ideas now and you're feeling quite confident with this one and happy to analyse it. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening and I'll see you guys soon. Thank you.